Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Calvin Sharfs and I'm the VP of Product Marketing at Pixelate. Pixelate is a leading provider of ad fraud monitoring and marketing compliance solutions and platform. Today we're going to be co-presenting a connected TV CTV programmatic ad supply trends from 2020. We're with a gentleman named Bill Condon at Zumo, and Zumo is a free ad supported television platform and app. We will introduce our panelists in just a moment. But first, let's do a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We will answer as many questions at the end of the webinar as possible. If we don't have time to answer your questions, we will respond directly to you in the next day or so, or we will respond to those in our blog post. Now, without further ado, we will do some quick introductions of the panelists. I'll introduce myself again, Calvin Sharfs, VP of Product Marketing at Pixelate, and I'm a dedicated ad tech and MarTech technology executive with over 20 years of experience managing products, including marketing, operations, sales, and personnel. I've worked with companies from Fortune 500 to small startups. And great, I'm uh, Bill Condon. So I am the SVP of Ad Partnerships at Zuma, a Comcast company. So I lead all ad sales and partnership revenue for Zumo across the globe. I've uh, been with Zumo for two years, uh, been in the space probably far too many years to count. Uh, prior to Zumo, I was at ESPN for seven years and previously before that, uh, stints at Yahoo, AOL, Point Roll, and one of the first interactive ad agencies uh, back in the late 90s, iTraffic. Great, thanks everybody. I am Tyler Lochner. I am the Senior Marketing Manager at Pixelate and I put together our research reports. I work closely with our data science team to um, put together the benchmark reports that you see um, Pixelate publish, including uh, the recent 2020 CTV Trends Report uh, that we're gonna dive into some of that data today. Um, anything on our blog, uh, all of our research will, will flow through me. Um, I was previously one of the earliest reporters covering the programmatic space at Media Post, uh, and then I uh, was at Accordant Media for a while before joining Pixelate. That's great. Thanks, everybody, for making those introductions. Um, I'll give you just a really quick 30 second um, kind of spiel about Pixelate. Um, we are a global ad intelligence and marketing compliance platform like i mentioned before we are mrc accredited for both ad fraud or for ad fraud detection across ctv mobile in-app and desktop mobile web and we offer a, a variety of uh, different software pla platform options including pre-bid blocking and analytics and a media ratings terminal for supply chain intel and as Tyler mentioned, we often publish research and education for the industry in our blog and also in our research reports, which is what we are going on and through today. Uh, so I encourage you to go to uh, our reports page at Pixelate and subscribe to get all of those reports. I'll pass it over to Bill to give him and Zumo a quick intro. Sure, so Zumo uh, is a Comcast company. We were actually acquired by Comcast um, Last year, the end of February, we are a free ad supported streaming TV service, or as folks in this industry, we, you know how we love acronyms, a FAST. Zumo provides 300 plus premium channels um, across our apps and native integrations. Um, channels consist of uh, 12 genres falling into the linear brand that you know and love, like an NBC News or PGA Tour or BN Sports and some digital first to digital only brands like a local now, Food52, Tastemade, or Fubo Sports. Um, you can access Zumo across almost every single connected device out there, uh, consisting of smart TVs, device connected TVs like Roku, Amazon Fire, 
uh, as well as IP-enabled set-top boxes, and I mentioned the smart TVs such as Samsung, LG, Vizio, Hisense, um, or devices as well like TiVo. Uh, Zumo is programmatic first, uh, driving a lot of our consumption, and we are also, I mentioned before, white labeling our technology that delivers across several smart TVs and connected platforms. I will now pass it over to Tyler. Yeah, thanks guys. So uh, you can kind of think of this as the table of contents, some of the key points that we're gonna talk about. Um, as everybody knows and people on the webinar, um, you guys are here because 2020 was a really big year for connected TV, that's, that's not a surprise. Um, I think some of the actual numbers now that the, the year has completed and we're able to look at a year in review, um, it's it's pretty impressive just how much uh, particularly programmatic connected TV advertising grew last year. According to Pixelate's data, and the, the, the data that Pixelate cites here is based on our data sets, which are predominantly open auction programmatic sources. Um, and in that environment, we saw a 2.2x increase or over 120% increase um, in 2020 compared to 2019 for programmatic CTV ad spend. So we're kind of in the hockey stick phase of growth for, for CTV right now. And that includes being able to reach more consumers. Uh, according to our data, 78% of US households are now reachable uh, through programmatic connected TV advertising. Uh, there's been a, a really large jump in the available inventory. We measured a 47% increase in the number of Roku apps or apps in the Roku channel store. Um, that support programmatic advertising last year. And there's also a lot of uh, really interesting movement happening in the space in terms of which devices are trying to get a slice of the pie. You've got, you've got your standard um, streaming sticks that have been around for a while, and now the smart TVs are really starting to ramp up um, their efforts in the space. And I know we're going to dive into that a little bit later because Bill has, and, and Zumo's in a really interesting position, so there's a lot of really interesting insight on kind of the CTV turf wars, so to speak. Um, but Calvin, one, do you want to talk a little bit about the the just reach of programmatic CTV, particularly in, in America that we saw last year? Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Um, as, you, as you noted on the previous slide, uh, we see 78% of U.S. households are now reachable via programmatic CTV advertising, and that was a steady rise over last year. At the end of 2019, we were seeing around 50% of households were reachable. So this made a rise of about 50, 56% year over year. So with that changing landscape, we've seen a much greater reach and access to consumers in 2020. So what we are saying and seeing that this was a very, very big year for expansion for CTV. And I know Bill has uh, has a really good front row seat to that. Yeah, I think uh, as you mentioned, Calvin, you know, we're definitely seeing a similar trend across Zumo as more you know consumers are adopting CTV and more impressions are sort of shifting from that traditional television, whether it's linear or cable. You know, clients and agencies are taking notice because that shift that's happening is they're going to either subscription services where there are no ads, which makes them sort of unreachable, but the place to reach them is on these free ad supported streaming TV services like a like a Zumo. And it's attractive because it's that tough to find cord cutter or cord shaver in an ad supported environment. Um, and then programmatic for us continues to sort of be the preferred vehicle to reach these buyers via transactions. Um, and I think it's because of just the operational efficiency that programmatic offers and also just the ability to sort of manage inventory across multiple devices as well as services um, through one easy dashboard. That's really great insight, Bill. Thank you very much. Um, but not only did we see uh, the growth of reach was met, but also the growth in ad spend has increased. So total programmatic ad spend that we were able to calculate was up 2.2 times or 122% in 2020. So just a phenomenal growth year. 
this is a year over year rise of, uh, as you can see, 100%. Um, we did see, however, the global pandemic slowed growth a little bit in Q2. It was still up approximately 10%. But the CTV ad market did not regress in Q2 like other markets. And we saw a considerable rebound over the second half of 2020. So, Bill, what did uh, what did Zuma see in 2020? Yeah, Calvin, I think you know, very similar growth. Um, and you hate to say the pandemic's been been good to you, but because people were indoors, because they you know got down to the bottom of Netflix and Hulu. And a lot of broadcast shows, sporting events were were canceled. It pushed a lot of folks into into free ad supported streaming TV services like Zumo. We saw a, a two hundred and fifty percent rise in engagement. And I think what's sort of what's driving that the trends can be you know the adoption of just streaming in general within the U.S. on these different services. Uh, the adoption of just different devices like a Roku or an Amazon, or more importantly, smart TVs, um, as people were cutting back and, and cord shaving or cord cutting, they were looking for alternatives um, from a cost efficiency standpoint, as, especially as the, the pandemic really hit people's wallets last year. They were looking for efficiency and they sort of found that efficiency in entertainment where, you know, Zumo, would be sort of sitting side by side with uh, a Disney Plus or an Amazon Prime. They'd get their coming, get their services and their viewing consumption there. And instead of adding on another subscription service, they wanted to supplement that viewing with some free ad supported streaming TV services. So they would come to Zumo and in the beginning, they would be watching a lot of news, getting informed about what was going on. And then they wanted to escape that would drive them into you know food or travel content or movies and tv just to sort of escape. And we saw that trend kind of continuing where at points they would come in to get educated or informed and watching news that they normally would not be able to get say on a netflix or a disney plus but find that within zumo be informed and said you know what i then want to escape so that was um that was a big kind of driver uh of what we saw and i think the great thing is they discovered our content and our service during this and we offered them an escape and it is also an opportunity to be informed and the great thing is of that 250 percent year-over-year growth and engagement that we've seen we've seen these users have discovered us like our content like our service and are, are sticking with us bill i think this data is really interesting uh, especially compared to the, the previous slide where uh, we saw that there was 122% growth in, in global programmatic CTV ad spend. Uh, it, in some ways, the fact that the Zumo platform saw 250% growth almost seems like uh, advertise, there's still a lot more room for growth for advertising. If the total market grew 122%, but one of the most popular CTV apps uh, saw 250% rise in user engagement, um, I think, that can indicate that 2021 will also be a, a year of rapid growth. And then I think that to your to your point about what consumers were watching during the pandemic, um, and then as it kind of weared on from a few weeks to a few months, did did any of their behaviors surprise you, or did it take advertisers a while to kind of catch on to what was coming next, or? Um, because I, I do think that the consumer patterns and behaviors last year were in some ways predictable. Like the fact that they watched more news is not a surprise. The fact that they watched more connected TV is not a surprise, but was there anything that they, they did do that you saw in your data that maybe was pretty interesting or a surprise, I should say? Yeah, I think the the patterns, I thought it was interesting at first where, you know, they were getting hyper informed and understanding what was going on and, and seeing this, the, the trends and the spikes, sadly, and what was going on across the country. And then that shift over to escapism. Um, I think the interesting thing, no surprise at first, but travel, you couldn't, you know, we weren't able to travel. So this idea of escapist, you know, seeing these exotic locations that were not 
allowed to go to at that current time because of the lockdown, um, almost offering sort of a window of the world that you couldn't get currently, um, considering you were staring at the same four walls. I think the other interesting thing is, I mean, not from a, a user standpoint, from an advertiser standpoint, I felt was interesting where we, we've definitely seen growth um, across direct and programmatic, but I think where advertisers and agencies, the smart ones started to realize that, you know, the, the TV shows and movies and other forms of entertainment were being delayed and they needed an outlet because, you know, insurance companies, other companies were still pushing out their products and, and being smart and having that one-to-one -one brand relationship with their consumers during this period. And those ad supported eyeballs that traditionally were happening on TV were shifting. Um, a lot of the smart advertisers realized they were shifting over to, to a Zumo or another free ad supported streaming TV service. And a lot of folks were looking to us to help sort of supplement and fill in those lost impressions or GRPs on a weekly basis. So we had some smart advertisers kind of come in and sort of hedge bets and realize that maybe, hey, are more sporting events going to be delayed? Is the NBA or the NFL or March Madness, is that not going to happen? You know, setting up deals with us and realizing, all right, we give advantageous terms with potential cancellations before that comes to realize, like, listen, we'll be your safety net because our audience isn't going anywhere. It's growing. It's almost sort of, you know, it was... Uh, our schedule was set. We have tons of content that wasn't impacted and advertisers saw that, realized it and kind of came and sort of hedged their bets. And we, we definitely saw a spike in, in a lot of our deals because people realized that this was a way to reach that specific audience. Hey, uh, Bill. Bill, this is Calvin. I was one of those escapisms about three, four months into it. I started watching old PGA tournaments yeah. um, on my LG TV. So, um, that was uh, that was I, I, I fit into that uh, into that pattern exactly. Yeah, and I think as you can see this, you know, great quote from from Colin, our, our our CEO. You know, we're seeing not only growth here but growth globally. Um, you know, what's driving that? And I think the the whole idea, if you look at connected TV in in general or OTT, I think when most people think about that, they almost just assume it's a Roku or an Amazon, Zumo has always sort of taken that ecosystem wide approach and making sure both in the US and across the globe that we're connected into devices and we're distributed where consumers are viewing. Um, and that's, you know, the, the smart TVs of the world, our branded kind of O and O apps, our partnerships with a lot of the the major TV manufacturer, Calvin, as you as you just mentioned, like an LG, we've had a partnership with them for for many years. Um, and then the other side of our business, as we sort of touched on earlier, is this idea of you know channel syndication. As Dumo's content is being distributed across these multiple platforms, it's important to kind of have a foothold in there. And I think the other piece that's really important for us is that international growth, as Colin mentioned in this quote here about Latin America. Like the key things for us is these partnerships with these TV manufacturers or device makers, you know, those, you know, those devices are sold globally and the technology is sort of built into that. So it's just a matter of making sure our content team is being smart and they are and getting programming that we have the rights to distribute across. So it's able to sort of turn that on. And as the trends that we're seeing over in the United States are following suit as OTT and CTV is really picking up in Latin America it's picking up across across Europe. So having those distribution points and sort of being almost say agnostic since we're in every single device, it allows us access to it. As long as we've got the content and the rights to distribute it, it's easily able to sort of take advantage of those of those trends. And the other important piece for our clients and advertisers and uh, clients and agencies and advertisers is that they have access to that to the ability if they want to go global, if they want to hit Canada or North America across not just one platform, but TT, CTV, across yeah. everything, we're a good partner. I, I, think, how you, I don't know how you do it, Bill. I keep getting more free stations on there too. So keep it, keep it up. I like it. Keep <laughs> adding more content. I, 
I was going to say uh, the, the data in our report, we, we're not going to go through all of it here and we'll share the full report with everybody um, listening in, but uh, we do break down the, the programmatic CTV trends by region, Latin America, uh, North America, Asia Pacific, and uh, Europe. And across each of the regions on a quarter by quarter basis uh, reacted a little bit different to COVID, but by the end of 2020, all of them had grown and were up by pretty significant margins year over year. So the, the growth is not just in America or just in, or just in North America. So it's definitely kind of a global phenomenon right now. Um, but you know, with that is also the fact that fraudsters are also riding this wave of connected TV. Um, a lot of a lot of advertisers, a lot of consumers rapidly adopted connected TV last year. A lot of advertisers obviously followed them. Um, but the, the the CTV ad fraud rates, and again, this is predominantly looking at open programmatic. So this is what happens. You could consider it the Wild West when things are left unchecked. Um, the CTV ad fraud rates remained pretty steady throughout the year, kind of around 20 to, to 25%. Uh, and this is in line with what Pixelate sees for mobile apps. So it, it makes um, buying app inventory on connected TV kind of as risky as it is buying mobile app inventory uh, on, on Google Play Store apps or Apple App Store apps. There's a, there's a lot of spoofing. Um, Pixelate uncovered a couple of CTV ad fraud schemes last year. And this can show the different ways that the fraudsters are attacking the connected TV landscape. One of the schemes we uncovered was it originated on a mobile app. It originated on the Grinder app, where the Grinder app was utilized by the fraudsters to spoof Roku traffic. So it was real Grinder app users. They were actually using their phones, and this scam was happening on the background of their phones. And it was pretending to be a Roku inventory, which obviously commands a higher CPM than a display ad within an app. Uh, an, an entirely different attack that we saw fraudsters take was a scam that we called Monarch, where there's a lot of, if anybody who has a, a connected TV or a Roku, I'm sure you guys have seen that there's a lot of apps that are kind of just, they're kind of just meant to be background. So like a fireplace, a virtual fireplace or a virtual aquarium. Um, one of the things we saw was that scammers had um they were those apps would have ad breaks and when those ad breaks came the scammers were spoofing other apps that um would use content from the public domain like the three stooges for example so the broku device had a screensaver like app showing on the tv but advertisers thought they were buying the three stooges um, so that's an example of one Roku app spoofing another Roku app. Um, and then I think we've we've all seen there's been a flurry of um, CTV ad fraud schemes that are based on server-side ad insertion or invalid SSAI traffic. Um, there's a handful of examples out there that if you, you know, you just Google it, you'll find some of them. And Advertising Age, I think last week, maybe two weeks ago, wrote a really solid piece overviewing CTV ad fraud, particularly server-side ad insertion. I know we we ran a webinar last year on the risks associated with um, server-side ad insertion in a, in a programmatic, or in a, an open programmatic environment. Um, we've got lots of blogs on that. We're not going to really dive into SSAI right now, but uh, it just goes to show that there's lots of different ways that the scammers are attacking this, this rise in CTV interest. Um, and again, this is this is really a view of what happens when it's not paid attention, when fraud is not paid attention to, or um, nobody is taking it seriously. But there are obviously lots of apps that do take it very seriously, one of them being Zumo. So, Bill, those are the numbers we were just looking at are kind of what happens when you don't really do anything and you don't you don't take the proper precautions or look for the right signals. So what is it that Zumo does that helps you guys be successful at uh, mitigating ad fraud. Yeah, no, um, I think it's a, some really valid points, Tyler. I think the key thing, like with with any any business, you you have to work with you know accredited 
partners, you know, making sure, you know, MRC accredited companies that have, that take it seriously like we do, that have a partner like a Pixel A, that work with sort of, you know, ads.txt. I think the key thing, and you touched upon, you know, some of these scams before, is you kind of know, you need to know what you're buying. Um, and then the transparency piece to us is extremely important where we're very transparent in terms of the, the content and where you're, where you're running um, is extremely important. I think the, the, you know, that piece about, you know, the screensaver for dogs, you know, it was really interesting article. I didn't know those things actually existed, but once again, you're buying on a platform and you don't know what you're buying. And I think the key thing too is this idea of direct relationships. Even though it's programmatic, when you're buying openly and you don't know what you're getting, you're opening yourself up to to fraud. And I kind of equate it to, you know, you have this expectation of what something is, you know, you kind of almost have to be street smart. So if you're walking down the street in the city and there's somebody out there on the corner and they're selling a Louis Vuitton bag for 150 bucks, you're like, wow, that's that's amazing. I'd equate that to a, a $5 or a $3 CPM in the open market on OTT and CTV, because you know when you buy that bag, you're you're not getting a real Louis Vuitton bag. Person's probably not giving you um, accredited paperwork. So just be smart and you will get what you pay for. And, and in order to do that, you to your point is like verify, verify, verify. Making sure one, you know who you're doing business with, you're two, you're having that direct relationship via programmatic private marketplace. And that that third piece is, you know, don't just take someone's word for it, have that MRC accredited or apps.ads.txt. Um, I think if you're smart and fraudsters wouldn't fraud if there wasn't so much money. And you hate to say it, it kind of reminds me of that old sort of like PSA where, you know, you something's going on and I learned it from watching you. We're enabling these fraudsters by blindly going out and transacting this way. Like they wouldn't be doing this if there wasn't a significant amount of money. And they're truly as Pixelate laid out and I've talked about here, there are ways to prevent that. So let's just be, be yeah. smart and protect ourselves and hopefully start shutting down and not funding and enabling these fraudsters. Yeah, it's been a it was a big business for them last year, that's for sure. Uh, but there there is definitely, Bill, like you said, there's a lot that that can be done. Um, I think last year was it's not like CTV was brand new last year, but it might have accelerated faster than everyone was fully prepared for. Um, but one of the things that was encouraging was we recently released a a report on app ads text adoption. We did it for the apps in the Roku channel store and apps in the Amazon Fire TV store. And I personally think these are uh, pretty encouraging numbers to see. This is looking at the top 500 Roku apps, and that's based on uh, programmatic ad volume as measured by Pixelate. But last year, the top 500 Roku apps, about 80% of them um, had app ads.txt already. The number is higher for the top 100. It's a little lower for the top 1,000. Um, you know, as you get a little bit longer in the tail, you're a little less likely to see app ads.txt files. Um, but the number was pretty high, I think, on Roku to see it at 80% for the top 500. It was good on Amazon, not quite as high. We saw 62% of the Amazon Fire TV um, top 500 apps had uh, ads.txt files by the end of 2020. Um, but this is, to your point, this is one of the things that people can do to, or people can utilize, and app as.txt files, they have to be properly utilized in order for them to be effective, but um, it, the foundation is already there for at least one of these industry-wide initiatives to, to help fight ad fraud and, and spoofing in particular. Our report, by the way, on the CTV app as.txt trends has other data points on uh, app as a text adoption by category, um, which I know will be interesting to a lot of people to see. Um, kind of moving on here, 
to get into what I personally think is the most interesting thing happening in connected TV right now, which is the landscape and the sheer number of players in the space. Uh, according to Pixelate's data, 46% of programmatic, again, predominantly open programmatic auction uh, CTV ads went to Roku devices. So that means the consumer was actually watching on a Roku device. Uh, Roku has had a pretty dominant market share for a while. I actually think just this morning I saw uh, Comcast's Freewheel, uh, one of your, another Comcast company released a report that said Roku on their platform was about 43% of the market share. So they're kind of in that 40 to 50% range of uh, taking that, that programmatic slice, but there's a lot of increasing competition behind them. Roku's market share is decreasing pretty slightly as this competition heats up. And right now, you know, we're seeing Samsung and Apple and then all these smart TVs are, are coming in. And Bill, I, I really want to pass it over to you because I think you have a really interesting, where you sit in this ecosystem is uh, kind of invaluable right now. The insight that you can get for what is actually happening uh, with all these platforms and the distribution of, of connected TV. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, I think we sort of touched on this a little bit before, but this idea of OTT or CTV, I think historically, you know, you mentioned Roku and Amazon, you know, they've done a really good job. You know, people, you know, Roku was the original, one of the earlier devices. And let's be honest, you know, people weren't thinking about smart TVs because when smart TVs first came out, they weren't particularly smart. The operating systems weren't great. They didn't have the apps or access to the content that people wanted. So hence the going out and you're having an expensive TV in your living room and then buying a Roku, like a hundred, anywhere from a 75 to a $200 Roku or Apple TV or Amazon to get the apps and the content that you wanted. Op TV manufacturers realize like, listen, we need to sort of own that glass and own that experience. And so what they do is give consumers what they want, a better operating system, um, access to all the apps and content that you would want, you know, working or working with a partner like a Zumo or creating your own free ad supported streaming TV service to keep them within that ecosystem. You know, we've we've seen that. And we, when we look at the OTT CTV landscape, it's important for us to sort of be everywhere and be the tech that kind of powers that. So anything from our owned and operated apps that are running on a Roku, an Amazon, you know, internet connected set top boxes like an X1 or Rogers in Canada, it's important to have those apps there because the consumers want that content, you need to be there. And on top of that, the, the smart TV, people were sleeping on smart TVs for the longest time, and now they're not because the growth has been tremendous. They've invested in that operating system and the experience and doing partnerships with a Disney Plus or a Hulu. You look at LG, we sit sort of side by side working with LG and LG channels and helping to kind of power that where you buy an LG TV, you bring it home, you've got access to 200 plus channels, and you also have Disney Plus sitting there, or Hulu, or Amazon Prime, or YouTube, all the content that you need. Um, so less reliance on plugging in another device. So as we look at the ecosystem and making sure that we are you know, creating our own and operated apps, you know, partnering with someone like an LG, or other TV manufacturers and creating, you know, channel syndications for these other services that potentially have their own free ad supported streaming TV service, but we have a potential relationship with another channel and they want to adopt that channel in their service. Zumo is helping to power that both here in the U S in Canada and across, across the globe. So it's important to, as you're looking at the OTT CTV space, not just automatically default to say the Roku's and the Amazon's and granted Tyler, your stats show that they're doing a really good job out there, but smart TVs are really picking up the consumption, um, making sure that you're thinking about them when you're buying inventory, but more importantly, the same trends that you're highlighting as well, be smart about activating programmatically, have that one-to-one -one relationship, direct sort of PNP, making sure that the 
steps are in place to manage against fraud. And I think the other thing, and the key thing is transparency. The partners that you're working with, you know, where where are your ads running? What content is that against? So making sure that if you're getting charged premium rates, you need to make sure it's premium content. Yeah, that everything you just said is is so interesting to me and is definitely something to watch. And to your point where right now, or at least in 2020, the data shows that someone like Roku has a dominant market share. Um, that's one reason Pixelate is benchmarking these numbers because we're going to continue to track it over time. And it, it's not going to be a surprise to see the smart TV manufacturers start to increase their market share. I think in the last, just in the last few months, or at least over the last six months, um, a handful of smart TV uh, manufacturers have released their own ad platforms. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean someone like a, a Roku or an Amazon will go away. Roku, even, you know, Roku has their own smart TVs as well. I think they, they were smart enough to see that smart TVs were um, another way to get that distribution. But the smart TV, the smart TV landscape, I think is really a, the place to watch right now. Um, there was a report out, I think Media Post reported on it yesterday, and it was from Hub Entertainment Research that said 70% of uh, US households now have a smart TV. And that's similar to the fact that uh, our data shows 78% of US households are reachable by programmatic uh, connected TV advertising. But the fact that smart TVs already have such a large footprint um, just shows that they could really ramp up the the market growth that they have uh, pretty quickly. I, I also, the, the data also showed that about 60% of houses with uh, people under age 35 in them, the TV that they have is a smart TV. So you can you can say that smart TVs are now the predominant TV choice in, in US households. So Bill, one question, one quick question I had for you was, um, how did those conversations with like an LG or, or a Samsung or other smart TV makers from Zumo's perspective, how did those conversations change last year with everything that happened? Yeah, I think the, the, the key thing there is, you know, they, the conversations are getting deeper and I think our partnerships are growing with these where you, you have to rely on partners that, you know, we might have a relationship with a certain you know content or channel partner and the best opportunities for us just to sort of take what we're exist we're currently doing and port it over to another platform um i think that they're fiercely invested in this and i think the key thing for those specific platforms all comes down to discoverability and being sort of built into that platform or you know making sure that lg wants to keep their consumers or their users and give them that value exchange. You can go and buy $150 TV, bring it home, put your rabbit ears in, connect to Wi-Fi and get 200 plus channels. Like that's a great value experience. And I think you're starting to see, as you mentioned, these TV manufacturers you know, kind of brand their own, you know, LG channels. Makes a ton of sense. You know, you don't necessarily want to be giving up your brand recognition you know, you will, my team will go into a bunch of agencies and we'll talk to people and ask them what kind of smart TV do they have? Because to your point, majority of TVs now sold their smart TVs and they'll say, well, I've got a Roku or I've got an Amazon. I was like, actually you have, if you've got a Roku, you probably have a TCL or another other device. So I think gone are potentially the days where these TV manufacturers want to have someone else brand their experience. So I think that right. competitive opportunity um, is is, is going to just continue to heat up. And I think we sort of saw that with our recent partnership with, say, someone like a, a TCL, where they have, you know, traditionally been, you know, running other operating systems. And now they're open and testing other things. Yeah, it's definitely an area that Pixelate will continue to track. Uh, we we might even carve out a, a specific look at just the smart TVs and, and market share. Um, one, one quick other data point just to show the 
distribution with on the Roku platform, if you think of the Roku channel store as its own uh, ability to, to grow, we saw a 47% increase in the number of apps that support programmatic advertising on Roku. I think it was about 20% on Amazon Fire TV. So there are, there's not just more smart TVs and device manufacturers entering the space, but there's also a lot more apps and publishers that are wanting to monetize their content um, through, through programmatic. Uh, Calvin, I'm gonna pass it over to you because I think uh, we got some questions uh, from the audience. I know we, we only have a few minutes, so we might not be able to answer all of them, but I will go ahead and pass it to you. That's great. We've got some, uh, some pre-sent in questions, um, and one was for you, Bill, specifically um, asking, why do consumers use a free ad-supported streaming TV service like Fast Zuma when there are so many ad-free services choices out there like Disney Plus, Netflix, Amazon Prime, et cetera? Yeah, no, I think, we get that question a lot, and I, I do think where the idea of people hate ads comes up all the time, and I'm like, well, I don't think they they hate ads. I think it's the the user experience where studies show in the United States, I think the average consumer has about 3.2 of these streaming services, and if you're truly doing like these subscription SVODs like a, a Disney Plus or an Amazon Prime where there's no ad opportunities, they might have cut cable, kept internet, and and done this, uh, but if they start adding on more, you're almost sort of recreating your own bundle and it's just as expensive as having a full on internet and TV experience. So they're turning to a free ad supported streaming TV service to potentially supplement that getting more content without adding more money on. Um, and they're doing things where you, you, for the most part, you can't really have you know, news on a Netflix um, or necessarily sporting events on a Netflix. So they'll come to us for news and sports. I think the other key piece is this idea of a value exchange between us and our consumers. They're coming to us and they're sticking with us because we're giving them 200 plus channels, allowing them to watch content that they aren't able to potentially get on these other services. But more importantly, that value exchange, we respect the, the ad experience. We're, you know, on average, we're about seven to nine minutes of ads per 60 minutes of content. And that's roughly anywhere, you know, potentially half or more of what you're seeing on standard television. So they're willing to stick with it. And I'll make one, I don't know, I don't know what it is about the Geico scoop, there it is. I still think some ads are also really good content. So as long as that ad experience, they're decent ads, people are willing to, to use that because I'm getting fair value and I'm happy with the content and I'm happy with the user experience and the ad experience. Yeah, that's true. There's certain ads you you don't mind sitting through because they're they're clever and and the creative has done very well on them. We got time maybe for one or two quick questions. This is another one, Bill, for you. Um, seeing the continued growth of CTV in LATAM, how does that shift Zumo's strategy in driving growth compared to a more established market like the North America? Yeah, I think the the strategy is to as long you know what as our overall strategy in terms of distribution to be built into all these devices that are available globally is important. So we're already we have a footprint. We're there. That next piece is to make sure that we have the proper content. You know, we're seeing this in Canada as well, where we've got distribution. There's definitely more need for French language content up there. So our, our, you know, our amazing programming team is going out and securing that content and making sure that we have the distribution rights for Canada. And then more importantly, let's flip that and let's turn it on in France or other areas. So I think you know, the distribution strategy is always gonna be there, being those devices that have the ability to, to be activated globally. And the next piece is just to make sure you're giving the users the content that they want in those regions and potentially sometimes that content could be in the language they want. We're also seeing that in the US right now where you know we've we've heavily invested in you know giving content that's relevant you know by working with our you know fellow Comcast partner Telemundo or Estrella TV or launching, going out and getting these telenovelas that are appropriate for our audience 
and super serving them in the US and that's driving more people. And once again, that idea of a value exchange, wait a second, I can come to Zumo and get news, but also I can get this really good content on Telemundo or Estrella, or I can watch you know, my favorite telenovela. So I think that same thing can hold true in giving folks the content that they want for free in the language that they want, easily accessible across multiple platforms. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's you know, content is king and you can serve up, you know, kind of multilingual content even in different markets because there are people there that are multilingual. It sounds like that's, that, that's kind of a takeaway there. Definitely. Well, I, I we've hit we've hit the forty five minute mark, folks. Um, I appreciate everybody joining. Uh, if we did not get to your question, uh, we will uh, re respond to those um, directly to you. Uh, we thank everyone. We appreciate you for being here. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Tyler. If you'd like to download the full report, you can visit um, the URL that's on the screen, um, and uh, we will also be sending that out as follow up to the uh, to the registration. We've also recorded this webinar and we will be uh, posting that in the next 24 to 48 hours. And we will send you a link uh, to that as well. Uh, feel free to pass that around to any of your colleagues or folks that in the industry that might, uh, might benefit from something like this. Again, we appreciate your time. Have a great day and we will talk to you folks later.